Kay's Emmanuel is a ROM hacker who's famous for the array of mods he's made for Super Mario 64. He's implemented remarkable optimization to the decompiled game code, even pushing Super Mario 64 to run at 60 frames per second. Kays joins the show to talk about his interest in Super Mario 64, ROM hacking, the N64 architecture, coding and assembly, and more. Be sure to check out Kays' YouTube channel to see his work, including breakdowns of how he accomplished his optimizations. Joe Nash is a developer, educator, and award-winning community builder who has worked at companies including GitHub, Twilio, Unity, and PayPal. Joe got his start in software development by creating mods and running servers for Gary's Mod, and game development remains his favorite way to experience and explore new technologies and concepts. Welcome to the showcase. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing very well. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. This has been a long anticipated episode by many folks here on the team. So I guess to kick everything off for the listeners who are not familiar, what is a ROM hack? Can you explain briefly, you know, what that is fundamentally for folks who haven't heard of it before? Right. So if you release a game, like on a console, you're going to have your game on a cartridge or on a CD. And a ROM hack is basically you dump the cartridge onto your computer, you modify the contents of it, and then you put it back in the console, and then you get to play it. Awesome. So in the context of, you know, Nintendo 64, that, you know, we're talking the big beefy cartridges. And what is it that's coming off that when you dump those? Well, it's just a huge file of just binary data, and you get to somehow make sense out of it. Awesome. So, I mean, that is a pretty esoteric way to go about programming. How did you get started doing this? So I think this was 2012. Mm -hmm. I randomly saw another mod someone made, and I've always liked making games. So I saw it, I was like, dude, this is possible. I want to make some do. Awesome. Okay. So when I was first introduced to your content, I was, you know, doing lots of mods for Super Mario 64. And then I was looking through those mods and was like, oh, these are increasingly intricate. Wait a minute. These are just like straight up other games. And so I'm kind of getting this idea that like you have made Super Mario 64 like your personal game engine at this point, which is that's an accurate <laughs> description of what you're doing with it. Yeah, pretty much. It's really just like using the visuals of Mario 64 and like the physics at this point, although even those are changed a lot. The underlying engine at this point, I basically like reprogrammed the whole thing because I wanted it to run well on the real N64. So I did use it for as like a game engine for like the longest time, but slowly I'm starting to replace the entire engine to like my own thing. <laughs> just like hollowing it out and living inside it. So yeah. <laughs> why SM64? Like where did that start? Why that game in particular? It was always a game during my childhood that I was involved with. I didn't have the game when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. I could only play it at a cousin's house. So it was a game that was in my mind for like years because I just couldn't never play through it because I didn't have the game. So it stuck in my mind and then it just, the interest grew. Interesting. So I said, you've got like loads and loads and loads of like things built on top of Super Mario 64. Do any of them, you know, for viewers who haven't seen them before, is anything sticking out as like your favorite that you'd recommend they check out? My favorite mod is usually always the last one I made. Mm -hmm. I think one that is very, very underrated that a lot of people should play. That's actually not a Mario 64 mod. It's The Missing Link. Okay. which is an interquel between Ocarina of Time and Madras Mask, like tells the story between those two games. And it's a very polished experience that I think is very fun. Awesome. Yeah, I would love to play that one. I've Similar to your story about playing Super Mario 64 as a kid, I, I had Ocarina of Time, but never got to play Majora's Mask. And so it's kind of stuck there as like a game that I'm like, one day I will go back and play all that game. So that sounds awesome as an interstitial between them. So could you walk us through a little bit on the process of like, how you're doing these ROM hacks, like what that looks like as a development process. And also I imagine, we'll get back to this later, I guess, but that process has changed for you over the years as well, right? Yeah, of course, especially with the decomp, everything changed. Okay, awesome. So like, where did it start? So back in the ROM hacking days, I guess. Yeah, back in the ROM hacking days, we would kind of make assets with the hacks editor. We had like little scripts that could convert OBJ files into microcode data, which is, you know, the model format that Mario 64 uses. We would use an assembly editor called LemASM, which would just have the assembly code of the entire ROM listed like top to bottom and you had to enter lines one by one. We didn't even have like anything to put the lines in. It was very, very painful to do. 
every time you enter the line, your computer would make the Windows error sound. <laughs> <laughs> You're used to hearing that like a thousand times a day. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any experience of assembly before you started doing this? Or is this like where you learned about assembly? No, assembly was basically my first programming language. Oh, incredible. I think like to a lot of developers, especially, you know, people with my development background, you know, web development, that kind of stuff, which a lot of, you know, I think a lot of audience live in that space. The idea of just like writing raw assembly to make something as complicated as a game happen is probably like absolutely nightmare inducing. <laughs> like, how do you even <laughs> begin to, is it just a case of like change stuff and see what happens to like get to grips with it? Okay. Assembly is actually one of the easier things to learn, I think, not because like it's easy to program in it, sure. but because... The N64 uses a MIPS architecture, which means right. there's just like 50 or 60 instructions you will ever need. Okay. You can just look through them and learn them in just a few hours. Cool. The difficult part is putting them together, but that's like a fun part, right? That's like solving a puzzle. That's like, yeah, there's there's things about that. The barrier to entry for assembly, I think, is a lot lower because when you program in C, you have to deal with compilers. You have to Google so many errors and figure out how it all works. Assembly, it just works. It makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, I guess that kind of reminds me of like, I got obsessed with a fourth dialect during the lockdown, just because there was like so little to it that it just felt like a really freeing environment. And I guess that kind of flies the same to assembly. So you mentioned the N64's architecture there. I don't want to make you just repeat your YouTube videos, which are excellent, but you've got, you do a really great job of like describing the memory architecture of, and how it interacts with the CPU and the GPU and rendering. Can you briefly tell us like how the Nintendo, I guess like how the, the N64 works as a console? Yeah, so the N64 has a shared memory. So the CPU and the GPU, which, you know, on the N64, it's not called GPU, it's called the RCP, the Reality Coprocessor, something like that. They share the same memory. So whenever you use the CPU, you also slow down the rendering, which makes this a very weird situation because, like, every time you optimize your code, you also optimize your rendering, even if it's completely unrelated. Right. And so that's been, I, as far as I understand it, that's been a focus of quite a lot of your optimization efforts for SM64. Can you, I guess, first of all, explain, like, why did you have to start optimizing SM64? Like, what were you trying to achieve? Yeah, so I was working on my mod, Return to Yoshi's Island. And while I was working on it, I think I was in, like, the fourth level. And I noticed the spot ran up, like, nine frames a second. Okay. And it wasn't really, like, I didn't really think it should run that poorly. So I looked under the hood, like what's going on in the engine. And I noticed it's like truly, truly terrible what's going on nowadays with my optimizations that spots runs like 60 FPS. The actual like on the hardware, the max is 30, right? So like you're... No, on the hardware, the max is 60. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Nice. So we've mentioned the hardware and the rendering thing. I know you did some things to get around that. What are some of the like most interesting optimizations you run into? I know there's a lot, so I don't know if that's an easy question to answer, but... It depends on who you are, what you find interesting. It's kind of difficult to answer. <laughs> I guess the interesting part is like that every time you optimize the CPU, the GPU gets faster. So a lot of my optimizations is like making sure that stuff is like better aligned to cache lines, making right. sure that like an entire thread on the CPU, like the render thread fits into just one block of cache or like the sound thread as well. That way you never have to like use the RAM and the GPU goes very fast. Awesome. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, I think James mentioned something similar where he was he was doing something to make sure it would fit all fit on the cache and wasn't hitting the RAM. So you mentioned earlier this like decomp effort. So you know, originally you were working from like the ROM dump, but now you have access to you know the Super Mario sixty four code or a version of the code. How did that come about? So there was a guy called Revo. He found out which compiler Nintendo originally used to make Mario sixty four. And if you have the exact same compiler, you can just take a function. And if you write a C code that's equivalent, it will compile to the exact same binary. And they use this to make a decompilation that compiles one to one to the exact same bytecode. Wow. Fascinating. So they decompiled it and then were able to determine if it was the correct implementation, if it should match the bytecode. Is that if I? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Okay. That's very cool. And I imagine that opened up a lot of doors for you in terms of like what you would then be able to do and the ease of what you'd be able to do. Was that like, were there some things that that enabled that you weren't quite able to do before? I guess optimization is one of them. Yeah, it's I mean, a lot, lot easier to work on C code than assembly code. You can make much more powerful changes very easily. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So along the way, now you've got access to that C code, you've been able to do some optimizations. Like what are some of the, I guess, like gameplay features you've been able to do that you weren't able to do before? 
uh, one thing that was very easy was uh, the multiplayer mode and binary i never really gave it a try there was a multiplayer mode but it shared the camera between both players but with the decomp and this was my first week of even learning c and within one week it was very easy to just add multiplayer and it literally just worked that's crazy that's the first i've heard of the multiplayer how did that work was there a server like managing the multiplayer was it peer-to-peer no it was on a cartridge right it was just the rom oh you okay. could just play it on the n64 with like two screens oh interesting okay Huh, fascinating. So you just plug two screens into the N64 and then just play? You just play it on the TV and it's a split screen, like the old N64 games. Okay, so it's like local multiplayer. Awesome. Sorry, I thought you were talking on my multiplayer for a minute. That shows you where games have gone, where I'm just like, so the world of split screen multiplayer has been so eviscerated, it didn't even (laughs) occur to my brain as an option. There is an online multiplayer that I made in, I think, 2017 or 2018. Oh, cool. And that was a lot easier to do because all you have to do is like, send the player position to each other. This was also in assembly, which, you know, Rough. much less powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, I guess, less on the technical, well, less on like the coding side and more, I guess, on like the, the implementation of the games and the design side. Because I was watching one of your videos recently. It was, I think, a video you're showing off a little bit of the, a new mod you're working on, the like underwater domes one. And mm-hmm. you said something really interesting where you were describing your level design ethos and wanting everything to have a sense of placeness. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? Yeah, placeness is just a random word that I made up. Um, it's kind of a meme that I make bad variable names, like far awayness and sort of distance. But it made sense in this scenario because it wasn't distance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so places is basically how much the level feels like an actual place you're in, right? The domes is a good example because it's you are like deep on the sea and it's like a reverse aquarium. You're like in these glass domes. It really feels like a place you can imagine yourself being in. And that's something I like in my levels. What are some things that you think really like make that sense of place in terms of like features you add to the game? I guess it's important that it's like an interesting fantasy, mm-hmm. right? Something where you play the game and then you go to bed and you're like, man, wouldn't it be cool to like explore this? I think what you need in your game is like, you need like decent platforming. It doesn't need to be anything super special and then cool ideas on top of that. And you already got a good game. So that's the idea here. Yeah, that's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I guess uh, like another one of your levels, which like I always think kind of like gives me that feeling like just from watching the videos is like the fit the theme park level i think particularly when there is like the womp being like posing for the photo <laughs> is like one where i'm always just like oh that just makes it feel like when there are like generic enemy npcs that are like doing people stuff you're just always like oh this is the living world it's very cool it's very interesting yeah exactly like that so one of the things that i saw very recently actually was that your mods are very popular with speedrunners Whenever we get a game dev on who's, who's got a bit of a speedrunning community, I always like to ask, have there been any runs of your content that have surprised you? Oh, I'm not actually sure if it's that popular with speedrunners. I feel like the Mario 64 speedrunners, what they value is just the platforming part okay. without any of the ideas. They just want like raw platforming. There are some content creators for like mods that are super popular with speedrunners, but they have basically zero casual audience. And I think it's like Brodiot, I think like 80 or 90% of Mario 64 ROM speedruns are his games. Right. But he just has like a thousand subscribers on YouTube because it's not accessible to like a casual audience. Of course, yeah. As like most yeah. pushing games to their absolute limits just becomes nonsense <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Super Mario 64 speedrunning has really become a surprisingly large content category, especially on Twitch, that I just. Oh yeah, it's huge. Awesome. So I guess kind of wrapping up, one of the questions that, you know, being very new to this space and not, you know, being familiar with you and being familiar with James, um, are there any other N64 or Super Mario 64 in particular ROM hackers or content creators that you're excited about and you'd recommend to the audience? So there is two very talented Mario 64 models I can think of. The first is Biobag. He's actually helping me with Return to Yoshi's Island. Cool. He's like insanely good at 3D modeling. He has super cool ideas. And the other one is Dan from Gomplay TV. Mm-hmm. He, like, what he does, dude, it looks so good. <laughs> He's like very, very good at 3D modeling and also very creative. Awesome. Cool. Those are some great recommendations. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us on the show today. No problem. I enjoyed it. <laughs>